And now chapter 23, Devahuti's Lamentation. Maitreya continued. After the departure of her parents, the chaste woman Devahuti, who could understand the desires of her husband, served him constantly with great love, as Bhavani, the wife of Lord Shiva, serves her husband. O Vidura, Devahuti served her husband with intimacy and great respect, with control of the senses, with love and with sweet words. Working sanely and diligently, she pleased her very powerful husband, giving up all lust, pride, envy, greed, sinful activities, and vanity. The daughter of Manu, who was fully devoted to her husband, looked upon him as greater even than providence. Thus she expected great blessings from him. Having served him for a long time, she grew weak and emaciated due to her religious observances. Seeing her condition, Kardama, the foremost of celestial sages, was overcome with compassion and spoke to her in a voice choked with great love. Kardama Muni said, O respectful daughter of Svayambhuvamanu, Today I am very much pleased with you for your great devotion and most excellent loving service. Since the body is so dear to embodied beings, I am astonished that you have neglected your own body to use it on my behalf. I have achieved the blessings of the Lord in discharging my own religious life of austerity, meditation and Krishna consciousness. Although you have not yet experienced these achievements, which are free from fear and lamentation, I shall offer them all to you, because you are engaged in my service. Now just look at them. I am giving you the transcendental vision to see how nice they are. What is the use of enjoyments other than the Lord's grace? All material achievements are subject to be annihilated simply by a movement of the eyebrows of Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. By your principles of devotion to your husband, you have achieved and can enjoy transcendental gifts very rarely obtained by persons proud of aristocracy and material possessions. Upon hearing the speaking of her husband, who excelled in knowledge of all kinds of transcendental science, innocent Devahuti was very satisfied. Her smiling face shining with a slightly bashful glance, she spoke in a choked voice because of great humility and love. Sri Devahuti said, My dear husband, O best of Brahmins, I know that you have achieved perfection and are the master of all the infallible mystic powers because you are under the protection of Yogamaya, the transcendental nature. But you once made a promise that our bodily union should now fulfill, since children are a great quality for a chaste woman who has a glorious husband. My dear Lord, I am struck by excited emotion for you. Therefore, Kindly make what arrangements must be made according to the scriptures so that my skinny body, emaciated through unsatisfied passion, may be rendered fit for you. Also, my Lord, please think of a suitable house for this purpose. O 
Vidura, seeking to please his beloved wife, the sage Kardama exercised his yogic power and instantly produced an aerial mansion that could travel at his will. It was a wonderful structure, bedecked with all sorts of jewels, adorned with pillars of precious stones, and capable of yielding whatever one desired. It was equipped with every form of furniture and wealth, which tended to increase in the course of time. The castle was fully equipped with all necessary paraphernalia, and it was pleasing in all seasons. It was decorated all around with flags, festoons, and artistic work of variegated colors. It was further embellished with wreaths of charming flowers that attracted sweetly humming bees, and with tapestries of linen, silk, and various other fabrics. The palace looked charming, with beds, couches, fans, and seats, all separately arranged in seven stories. Its beauty was enhanced by artistic engravings here and there on the walls. The floor was of emerald, with coral dioceses. The palace was very beautiful, with its coral thresholds at the entrances, and its doors bedecked with diamonds. Gold pinnacles crowned its domes of sapphire. With the choicest rubies set in its diamond walls, it appeared as though possessed of eyes. It was furnished with wonderful canopies and greatly valuable gates of gold. Here and there in that palace were multitudes of live swans and pigeons, as well as artificial swans and pigeons so lifelike that the real swans rose above them again and again, thinking them live birds like themselves. Thus the palace vibrated with the sounds of these birds. The castle had pleasure grounds, resting chambers, bedrooms, and inner and outer yards, designed with an eye to comfort. All this caused astonishment to the sage himself. When he saw Devahuti looking at the gigantic opulent palace with a displeased heart, Kardama Muni could understand her feelings, because he could study the heart of anyone. Thus he personally addressed his wife as follows. My dear Devahuti, you look very much afraid. First bathe in Lake Bindu Sarovara, created by Lord Vishnu himself, which can grant all the desires of a human being, and then mount this airplane. The lotus-eyed Devahuti accepted the order of her husband. Because of her dirty dress and the locks of matted hair on her head, she did not look very attractive. Her body was coated with a thick layer of dirt, and her breasts were discolored. She dove, however, into the lake, which contained the sacred waters of the Sarasvati. In a house inside the lake, she saw one thousand girls, all in the prime of youth, and fragrant like lotuses. Seeing her, the damsel suddenly rose and said with folded hands, We are your maidservants, tell us what we can do for you. The girls, being very respectful to Devahuti, brought her forth, and after bathing her with valuable oils and ointments, they gave her fine new spotless cloth to cover her body. They then decorated her with very excellent and valuable jewels, which shone brightly. Next, they offered her food, containing all good qualities, and a sweet inebriating drink called asavam to improve her metabolism. Then in a mirror, she beheld her own reflection. Her body was completely free from all dirt, and she was adorned with a garland. Dressed in unsullied robes and decorated with auspicious marks of tilak, she was served very respectfully by the maids. Her entire body, including her head, was completely bathed, and she was decorated all over with ornaments. 
she wore a special necklace with a locket. There were bangles on her wrists and tinkling anklets of gold about her ankles. About her hips, she wore a girdle of gold set with numerous jewels, and she was further adorned with a precious pearl necklace and auspicious substances. Her countenance shone with beautiful teeth and charming eyebrows. Her eyes, distinguished by lovely moist corners, defeated the beauty of lotus buds. Her face was surrounded by dark curling tresses. When she thought of her great husband, the best of the sages, Kardama Muni, who was very dear to her, she, along with all the maidservants, at once appeared where he was. She was amazed to find herself surrounded by a thousand maids in the presence of her husband and to witness his yogic power. The sage could see that Devahuti had washed herself clean and was shining forth as though no longer his former wife. She had regained her own original beauty as the daughter of a prince. Dressed in excellent robes, her charming breasts duly girded, she was waited upon by a thousand Gandharva girls. O oh, destroyer of the enemy, his fondness for her grew, and he placed her on the aerial mansion. Though seemingly attached to his beloved consort while served by the Gandharva girls, the sage did not lose his glory, which was mastery over his self. In the aerial mansion, Kardama Muni, with his consort, shone as charmingly as the moon in the midst of the stars in the sky, which causes rows of lilies to open in ponds at night. In that aerial mansion, he traveled to the pleasure valleys of Mount Meru, which were rendered all the more beautiful by cool, gentle, fragrant breezes that stimulated passion. In these valleys, the treasurer of the gods, Kuvera, surrounded by beautiful women and praised by the Siddhas, generally enjoys pleasure. Kardama Muni, also surrounded by the beautiful damsels and his wife, went there and enjoyed for many, many years. Satisfied by his wife, he enjoyed in that aerial mansion, not only on Mount Meru, but in different gardens known as Vaishrambhaka, Surasana, Nandana, Pushpabhadraka, Chaitra Ratya, and by the Manasa Sarovara Lake. He traveled in that way through the various planets as the air passes uncontrolled in every direction. Coursing through the air in that great and splendid aerial mansion, which could fly at his will, he surpassed even the demigods. What is difficult to achieve for determined men who have taken refuge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead's lotus feet? His feet are the source of sacred rivers, like the Ganges, which put an end to the dangers of mundane life. After showing his wife the globe of the universe and its different arrangements, full of many wonders, the great yogi Kardama Muni returned to his own hermitage. After coming back to his hermitage, he divided himself into nine personalities just to give pleasure to Devahuti, the daughter of Manu, who was eager for sex life. In that way he enjoyed with her for many, many years, which passed just like a moment. In that aerial mansion, Devahuti, in the company of her handsome husband, situated on an excellent bed that increased sexual desires, could not realize how much time was passing. While the couple, who eagerly longed for sexual pleasure, were thus enjoying themselves by virtue of mystic powers, a hundred autumns passed like a brief span of time. The powerful Kardama Muni was the knower of everyone's heart, and he could grant whatever one desired. Knowing the spiritual soul, he regarded her as half of his body. 
dividing himself into nine forms, he impregnated Devahuti with nine discharges of semen. Immediately afterward, on the same day, Devahuti gave birth to nine female children, all charming in every limb and fragrant with the scent of the red lotus flower. When she saw her husband about to leave home, she smiled externally, but at heart she was agitated and distressed. She stood and scratched the ground with her foot, which was radiant with the luster of her gem-like nails. Her head bent down. She spoke in slow yet charming accents, suppressing her tears. Sri Devahuti said, My lord, you have fulfilled all the promises you gave me, yet because I am your surrendered soul, you should give me fearlessness too. My dear Brahmin, as far as your daughters are concerned, they will find their own suitable husbands and go away to their respective homes. But who will give me solace after your departure as a sannyasi? Until now, we have simply wasted so much of our time and sense gratification, neglecting to cultivate knowledge of the Supreme Lord. Not knowing your transcendental situation, I have loved you while remaining attached to the objects of the senses. Nonetheless, let the affinity I have developed for you rid me of all fear. Association for sense gratification is certainly the path of bondage. But the same type of association performed with a saintly person leads to the path of liberation, even if performed without knowledge. Anyone whose work is not meant to elevate him to religious life, anyone whose religious ritualistic performances do not raise him to renunciation, and anyone situated in renunciation that does not lead him to devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, must be considered dead although he is breathing. My Lord, surely I have been solidly cheated by the insurmountable illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For in spite of having obtained your association, which gives liberation from material bondage, I did not seek such liberation. Thus ends the 23rd chapter of the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Devahuti's Lamentation.